Honorable Dr. Shem Ochodo with Fayaz Qureshi. Thank you for the privilege of your company. Stay well, stay safe. Welcome to the Living Legends. I am Fayaz Qureshi. In this edition of the Living Legends, we speak to a man whose contribution to Kenya's online scene may have been forgotten. 30 years ago, he became the father of internet to Kenya. He went on to consult in the same field for the republics of Rwanda and South Sudan. To most people, he's known as the former MP for Rangwe constituency. On the Living Legends, tonight, we speak to Honorable Dr. Sham Ochwodo. Dr. Sham, thank you. It's an extreme pleasure to have an absolute legend like you <laughs> thank on you. the Living Legends as our guest. Thank you. Asante sana. Thank you, Kuresh. Um, thank you, KBC. I'm greatly honored. I didn't think I merit to be considered a legend, but thank you so much. In our eyes, you do. <laughs> and this, is a, this is a tribute to you. I appreciate now, it. Let's start off with your early life and education. Right. I. Hmm. I went to a primary school in Homa Bay mm -hmm. called Nyaweta Primary School. I had the privilege of jumping from standard one to standard three um, for two reasons. One, uh, in our time, those from primary three upwards would go back to school in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Standards one and two would go, and then at lunchtime they go home. Right. I think I was so much in love with school that I would request the teachers, can I come back? So for some reason, um, the teachers allowed me to go to standard three after standard Extremely one. dedicated at a very early point in your life, huh? <laughs> That's right, yeah. And I should say I also went further to for standard seven. I scored uh, three straight A's, wow. which was the first time that school, uh, Nyawita was getting somebody with 36 points at our time. And I think it took about 10, 12 or so years after me. There was somebody else who I think got 36 points. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I enjoyed being in that school and I keep in touch with the school. And then thereafter, I went uh, to secondary school. Something interesting here happened. With 36 points, I would go to any school in Kenya that I yes. wanted. But um, <clears throat> a rural headmaster then, as they were called, now I think principals, didn't think anybody would get Max to go to Alliance. So Alliance wasn't among my choices. My number one choice, because you had to take a national school, right. was Mawego Technical School. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my first choice. The second and third were local schools, uh, Migori, I think, and Sawagongo, if I can remember, in okay. Nyanza. Actually, Mawego, I think, was number four because you had to take one national school. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when it came to intake, the national schools were taking people first. And that tells me also something, uh, that um, we haven't handled technical education very well in this country. I was happy that I've been through, through and through technical. Because after my way ago, I went to Mombasa Polytechnic for my advanced uh, level uh, studies, what was then called A-levels. Right. I know most people know Kenya Polytechnic, Mombasa Polytechnic, but for diplomas and higher national diplomas. In our time, they used to offer, at least Mombasa Polytechnic was offering A-levels. Okay, interesting. Then after Mombasa Polytechnic, I was admitted at the University of Nairobi to do architecture. I didn't quite like, um, I missed engineering with one point. And um, I wanted to do electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. So I was told if you go instead to do science, physics, uh, and you do well in first year, second year, you can shift over to the faculty of engineering. And I worked so hard, I think I left another record there. I'd, I think we had about 12 subjects. In first year, I had 10 A's and then two B's. So uh, I should have naturally in the second year changed over to electrical engineering. Right. But by that time, I'd become so much in love with physics, I even forgot. I just remembered about two months later that my plan was to shift, but it was already too late now to shift. Those days, people could change faculties mm -hmm. on certain conditions. Right. So I did, um, of course, we had a stint in 1982. We happened to have been state guests. I was a student leader 
I uh, was incarcerated for 10 months and um, immediately were released. We were put to do exams. Um, I got an upper second um, and I got admitted to do masters and I got scholarships too at the same time to do masters in physics and also to do masters in electrical engineering. So my time to now transit to electrical and electronics engineering had come. So I did my masters at the University of Nairobi and then um, I immediately was absorbed also as a tutorial fellow. I think first as a graduate assistant at the university. As a tutorial fellow, then I got a scholarship British Council. Then it was um, overseas development assistance, ODA, uh, to study in the UK. I, was, I went to the University of York where I did my PhD in software engineering. But something I should say, while at the University of Nairobi, I think we were the second lot with uh, Professor Gerald uh, Chege, mm -hmm. who were the second to graduate in masters. Before us, only one person had graduated with a master's from electrical engineering, University of Nairobi, and I think it took her eight years. We did it in two and a half years, which was also a record. Wow. So we both went to the UK with uh, Gerald. We went slightly to different routes. So I went into software engineering, particularly for telecom systems. And I did some assignments with um, British Telecom, Telecom Australia, Marconi Telecom, Italy, and so on. So it was a, it was a great progression. Absolutely. From uh, engineering to software. A, uh, that's engineering. right. That's right. And in the process, I should say I was very likely the first Kenyan software engineer. And um, the first Kenyan software engineer. Correct. That's and historic. Yeah. Well, my great pleasure. That's why we have you here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Koresh. And then I went for a postdoctoral fellowship in the U.S. University of California, Berkeley. I think the rest is history. I was happy to come back home in 19, around 1992. That was a lot of work. Was there any time to play? Uh, no, well, a little bit. I used to play <laughs> tennis. Actually, while at the University of Nairobi, I, at one point I was captain of uh, lawn tennis. So there was a bit of that, but um, a lot of time was spent reading. Reading. Well done, well done. Thank you. Now, you're among... Now, the father of internet. Right. Okay? Sure. Uh, it was actually tested at your house. Yes, internet came through one of my... Not many people know that. Yeah, I know a little... Facts are being distorted. A little bit of distortion happened. I think um, the past um, 17 or so years have largely been outside the country. In fact, apart from Rwanda and South Sudan, right. I've had opportunity to do things in about um, nearly 40 other African countries for a short term, two weeks, up to uh, a maximum of about 13 years that I have done in South Sudan. So, yeah. but so that was 30 years ago when the internet was first tested and that was at your residence. To be precise. With a few technicians around you. That's right. We had a few engineers I was working with. Uh, it was actually 26 years to be exact. Okay. Because it happened on the night of um, 24th October 1995. So will soon be we celebrated 25 years of internet actually in Africa so tell us more about this how exciting was this whole thing it was extremely exciting because when while in the UK and the US and Australia because after you as uh, I, I did some time some I some further research work with uh, what was then called Telestra or Telcom Australia but I decided to come back home and uh, against all manner of advice. Why do you go back home? You know, you basically become a citizen of the world. What was the reason? I love uh, my patriotism? Patri Nationalism? Uh, patriotism? Giving, giving back? Because we, we're actually getting a brain drain now. <laughs> actually, we have a brain circulation because I'm heavily involved in matters of diaspora mm. at the moment. Right. But at that time, it was patriotism, but also I felt that uh, we needed to uplift our people. Mm -hmm. So coming back home, I realized there was no internet, and then I said, okay, how on earth in today's world can somebody do meaningful research without internet? Without the internet. So I started working the journey. It wasn't easy, but we were happy. Mm -hmm. Through the support of uh, U.S. National Science Foundation, NSF, and again the ODA, UK Overseas Development Agency, 
they were able to support us and we got internet uh, working with our engineers we had to spend um, nearly 28 hours just trying to connect wires to get to talk mm -hmm. to Oregon in the US mm -hmm. to get Kenya connected right. but it was even more interesting before that uh, uh, crash because uh, we used to have what was called dial up right. and um, when we started um, uh, and then I was like the main server uh, that was carrying all Kenyan information mm -hmm. and people would dial through the server in my house and collect their mails. Soon after, UNEP also started offering a service like that. Mm -hmm. But when we started, we used to dial once a week. Every Wednesday midnight, we would pick all mails destined for Kenya. And then people would dial our server whenever they want. It was like a mailbox, a post office. Wow. They pick and drop. <laughs> um, store and forward was the system. And then from once a week, we moved on to three times a week. And then once a day, and then four times a day, and then every hour, until eventually we got into what now we call uh, TCP, which is real-time internet. internet. So that's the journey we walked. When we used to poll, we used to call through London, an organization called Greenet. Mm -hmm. And of course, often I used to travel a lot. So my wife herself became a specialist because now somebody had to keep operating the server. Okay. In fact, one joke is um, <clears throat> my youngest um, daughter who was a toddler then would come and grab me from the computer room saying, Dad, if you don't have anything interesting to do, come we play. You know? <laughs> <laughs> For her, uh, that was um, more exciting to play than to do fidget with the, right. with the wires. Yeah. Part of my going to, in, to, poly, to politics actually was um, not because that was my calling. It was because I felt I needed to push the technology agenda in the country. In fact, even before the internet, as chair of Computer Society of Kenya, then it was called Kenya Computer Institute, I had this onerous task to convince uh, also not only people in government, but even the corporates hmm. that computers were good for the country. The older members of a society may recall a past president, uh, later President Moi, God rest his soul in peace, said in a rally in Nakuru that Kenya does not need computers, they're going to take away jobs. So part of our work as professionals was to convince government that after all computers weren't so bad. Even banks, initially computerizing was a nightmare. But I'm glad we went f in, in that manner. Mm. The same could have been said of also the internet. Even though I was voted father of internet in year 2000, when I was accepting the award, I did attribute it to three very special Kenyans. I don't think internet would have happened then uh, had it not been for them. Mika Cheserem mm -hmm. was then governor of the Central Bank. Central Bank, yes. Uh, Dr. Ambassador Benjamin Kipkule was Kenya's ambassador in the U.S. at the yes, time. Right. And uh, Brigadier Wilson Boynet okay. then was the head of what today is like NIS. Okay. So they were quite instrumental. They were it, uh, extremely, extremely instrumental because at one point the governor did visit the ambassador in the U.S. In that time, and before he came back home, and before internet happened, if you were outside the country... For me, being in the UK, we would only get newspapers like on Jamuri Day when we would travel from York to London to the High Commission for Jamuri Day celebrations, and then you find a two or three month old newspaper. Hmm. Or unless you called home, but it was very expensive to call. So, how we got internet to start around um, 92 conversations, because we also rallied Kenyans together. Before then, it wasn't possible. Maybe this is when people talk of uh, five of us. There were six of us who were outside who created what became KenyaNet, but that was more for the diasporas outside. There were three members, uh, uh, Isi Makatiani, uh, Ouma Gor, and Gakio Karanja at MIT in the US. There was and still is uh, Dr. Matunda Nyanchama in Canada. And there was and still is uh, Dr. Otia Numbari in Finland, and I was in the UK. We were all IT specialists. Okay. 
uh, let's call ourselves informaticians because my students often ask me what do we call ourselves they're engineers doctors accountants mm -hmm. we're informaticians mm -hmm. so the six of us were informaticians so we started exchanging information on the internet when somebody calls home you share that gave birth fast forward to what became KenyaNet later Kenya Community Abroad, and now Kenya Diaspora Alliance. Mm -hmm. So, well, that was the journey how we got internet here. Right, the regulatory <coughs> framework. Yes. Has it changed? Okay, yes, I was mentioning... And what are the major game changes right absolutely. now? Absolutely. Part of why I went to Parliament was to push the technology agenda. I remember once um, we had a workshop with members of Parliament then. Uh, 32 attended and strangely 31 were from the opposition then. Right. Only one from government was uh, the minister then, later Dr. Zachary Onyonka was minister for science and technology right. attended. He opened the workshop. One of the MPs, or let me say two, inspired me to get into politics, the late Dr. Kiyombaka and um, Honorable Alo Geka. Dr. Mbaka said, Shem, these things you are telling us sound very interesting, but they don't mean much to us. Maybe if you were one of us, policymakers would listen to you. So that's when I started having ideas of getting to parliament. Unfortunately, in 96, 97, I was elected to be Rangwe MP. My greatest contribution while in parliament was the 2008 communications law. This is the law that liberalized the telecom sector. Uh, let me say that two years before, in 1996 and 1997, the draft bill before parliament was shot down. Then the late uh, Ntimama, or Ntimama William, mm -hmm. was minister for communications before him. I think um, Mwishimua, uh, former deputy, now right honorable prime secretary, right. uh, Musalia Mudavadi was uh, in communications. but. Twice Parliament refused the communications law because the MPs were saying we don't want to sell away our sovereignty. So when I got to Parliament, I was able to first rally a group of six MPs mm -hmm. um, that eventually also gave birth to Mungano wa Mageuzi in uh, English, that's a national rainbow coalition. All right. Uh, so, but these six convinced another 22 MPs who are calling ourselves progressives who said no this is good for the country and they moved the other members of parliament to pass the communications law yeah and it's helping the generation Abs of today absolutely <laughs> now you've consulted for the republic of south sudan on matters technology yes uh, what are your experiences working for the world's youngest nation um pretty interesting um you will allow me to talk a little more about rwanda okay. uh, partly because of uh, um, I still have connections. You, when you are a civil servant, you are a bit constrained in what you can say. But as a former okay. uh, senior advisor... Shall we do South Sudan and then we'll talk extensively okay. about uh, so Rwanda? For, for South Sudan, my greatest uh, contribution, and I should say, despite being the world's youngest country, mm -hmm. it's only South Sudan apart from the United States, which has got a tele phone cord that has got a meaning. Why am I saying this? The USA and Canada is plus one because it's America. Right. South Sudan, you know Kenya we have plus two, four, two, five, five, four. Yeah. What does it mean? Uganda, two, five, six. What does it mean? Two, five, five, four. Tanzania, what does it mean? South Sudan is two, one, one. The year of independence, 2011. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's been it. The other major achievement was um, South Sudan is .ss. That's also something we pushed hard for. Having secured .ke, which was the Kenyan domain, Kenya, which yes. administered for about right. 10 years before handing over. Um, the South Sudan, there was quite a bit of resistance. There is, uh, I, think an, I think, an underground movement, .ss, and that's being awarded by international standards organization. So again, we used quite a bit of the connection we have globally in the telecom and the standard sector to secure that. You were the ICT advisor to Rwanda's Minister of State yes. in charge of uh, energy and communications. Right. And CEO of the Rwanda Information Technology Authority. Correct. RITA. Correct. Tell us more about this. I, 
greatly enjoyed. I've had the privilege to work for four different heads of states, different countries, including Rwanda. And I really enjoyed working for President Kagame because he's very tech savvy. And uh, he's a go-getter. Three things I learned from him. One is humility. He would tell us, I meet uh, wazungus or donors. I call them sir. At the end of the day, I get what I need for the Rwandese people. I'm still the president. The second lesson I picked from him was looking at the big picture. Uh, don't worry too much about little things. And don't worry about things you have little control over. Mm. The third final quest, uh, point, lesson I got from him was sense of urgency. He would say, Rwanda has so much been left behind the world that we have to move three times, at least twice, as fast to catch up with the rest of the yes. world. And uh, when the new administration was elected in Kenya, I thought uh, President Dr. Ruto, who was privileged to serve within the 8th Parliament as well, uh, was reading from the same script. I saw a retreat being held outside. President Kagame used to do that. Once at the beginning of the year, they would go out with the top government officials, uh, as probably the only foreigner who joined, given my level, the level of office I was holding. I think President Kagame has been such a role model Absolutely. for the whole of Africa, hasn't he? Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I, you having met him personally must be an amazing oh, experience. Absolutely. And we used to brief him very often, at least once every quarter. Yeah. And um, he wanted results, and he would take decisions on the spot, as long as you had a good thing to do for Rwanda. So moving on, you think our <coughs> government is heading in the same direction? I thought, I thought it was. It still remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. When I saw the retreat take place, and I saw the president reprimand his cabinet secretaries with President Kagame, and in Rwanda, ministers come five minutes before meetings, and that's known. So I saw a bit of that. I'm hoping that uh, we continue reading from that script and give some results so that we lift Kenyans out of poverty. Of course, Rwanda is the only country on earth where there are more women MPs than men. Oh. Yeah, so gender is a major issue. There are many of us who are lucky to get uh, computers into schools when Kenya was trying to get uh, laptops to schools. Uh, I thought it was being done the wrong way, but we didn't have opportunity to give in. It's been an extreme pleasure hosting Dr. Shem Ochodo on The Living Legends. We can confidently call him the father of the internet in Kenya for being responsible for the internet test run in the country. He has consulted for the governments of Rwanda and South Sudan, currently leads the Kenyan Diaspora Alliance and has been Rangwe MP. Thank you, Dr. Shem Ochodo, for being our guest today. I am Fayaz Qureshi. Thank you for watching.